first thing we need to do is discuss a little about how the trigger system works in the SKS. This illustration is something that I cobbled together from different pictures, but it gives an idea of how the hammer strut and hammer, sear, trigger, and trigger bar are oriented when installed in the trigger housing. An unusual looking object between the trigger and the trigger bar is a safety spring. When the trigger is pulled, the trigger assembly rotates around the trigger pin. This rotation causes the trigger bar to move forward and press against the sear. This pushes the sear out from under and releases the hammer. Now let's get the trigger assembly out of the way and just look at the sear and the hammer. The hammer spring is installed on the hammer strut and places forward tension on the hammer. The hammer tries to rotate around the axis of the hammer pin. This rotation places pressure on the top of the sear. The most important aspect of the trigger pull on an SKS is the angle at which the hammer contact surface bears against the sear contact surface. There are three categories used to describe this engagement angle. The first is negative engagement. This is the least desirable of the engagement angle categories and, if the sear does not have sufficient engagement, can actually be dangerous. In negative engagement, the top of the sear is angled down towards the hammer. Because of this angle, the force of the hammer is not straight down onto the sear, but going downhill. Because the hammer is fixed in place laterally, this force tends to try to push the sear in the opposite direction of the force. In the case of negative engagement, the force applied by the hammer is actually trying to force the sear out from under the hammer. This means that if the sear is not seated far enough underneath the hammer, any bump or bang could cause the sear to pop out, releasing the hammer and causing the rifle to fire. Negative engagement is characterized by significant creep, with the hammer inching forward as the trigger is pulled prior to release. Watch specifically for the hammer movement relative to the starting point as the sear moves. Next is neutral engagement. In neutral engagement, the contact angle between the hammer and sear are perfectly perpendicular. The force imparted on the sear by the hammer is basically straight down. Neutral engagement could be considered acceptable and is better than negative engagement, but is not the safest and is not preferred. In neutral engagement, the hammer does not vary relative to the starting point as the sear moves. Finally, positive engagement is the most safe and is the preferred type of engagement on the SKS and most other firearms as well. In positive engagement, the sear to hammer angle is again not perpendicular, but the downhill direction in this case is trying to force the sear farther under the hammer rather than pushing it out. With positive engagement, the distance that the sear is required to be seated under the hammer is much lower than with negative engagement while still maintaining a safe rifle. This means that with positive engagement, the trigger creep can be reduced significantly. Positive engagement is characterized by the hammer moving to the rear as the trigger is pulled. Again, pay attention to the hammer relative to its starting point as the sear moves. It is important to note that the rearward movement of the hammer that results from positive engagement increases the tension on the hammer spring and, therefore, increases the trigger pull. For that reason, we don't want the engagement to be excessively positive, just enough to make the rifle safe with minimal creep. Next thing we need to talk about is the tools that you're going to need. You're not going to need, need anything fancy, but there are a few things you'll need and a few things that are nice to have. Uh, the first thing that you'll need is some uh, emery cloth sandpaper. I use 600 grit. You can use finer if you have it, or you can use different grits to, to do different jobs. You also need some stones. Now I use gunsmithing stones that I got from Midway USA, and I believe mine are in fine and ultra fine. You can use regular sharpening stones if, if that's all you have available. I've used those types of stones and they do work. You're going to need some pin punches and I've got a selection of pin punches, different sizes, starter punches, things like that laid out here. Uh, obviously you're going to need something to tap the pin punches with so we have a combination brass plastic tap hammer and we also have a ball peen hammer and I have a selection of ball peen hammers and you don't always need those but some pins can be hard to come out and if they are, it's always better to use a bigger hammer than to try to hit it harder. Bigger hammers with more mass can move the pins without damaging them. Next, a pair of needle nose pliers, pretty basic. A set of jeweler's files always comes in handy. And uh, this is just a cheap set that I got at Harbor Freight for about 5 or $6. So nothing too fancy there. And last, the, the, this isn't required, but it's very nice to have. It makes some of the operations much, much easier. Is a bench vise. And I've got a... a pretty decent bench vise that I got again at Harbor Freight Tools. I buy most of my tools there because their prices are very reasonable. I got it at Harbor Freight for about $35. A couple other things that you will need would be some cold blue to refinish the areas where you have to sand or polish and a straight edge which helps you use the emery cloth to hit the rails and things like that. And we'll see that when we get to that part of the trigger job. 
One of the biggest problems that we see with these SKS triggers is the engagement of the sear to the hammer is incorrect, which can make the, the rifle unsafe. Uh, typically what we see is a, a negative engagement and what we want to see is positive engagement. To understand that we need to take a look at it. I'm going to use this little screwdriver to push down on the disconnector because the disconnector prevents the, the trigger from being pulled until the bolt is all the way closed. So we have to push it down and simulate the bolt pushing down on the top of it until the, the trigger bar engages with the sear. And it's kind of a tight adjustment. You've got to be right on the money for it to work. Watch the hammer move, creep forward as the trigger is being pulled. And you'll notice it's very creepy and it's also very, very rough. That creep is the safety mechanism that prevents the sear from being able to pop out and allow the hammer to fall. It puts so much travel, uh, so much sear engagement under the hammer to, that creates all that creep. But the reason they do that is because they've got ne uh, negative engagement. And that negative engagement is dangerous unless you have enough creep in it to prevent the sear from being able to push out from under the hammer without the trigger being pulled. So that's the reason that we're doing a trigger job. We're going to get rid of that negative engagement. We're going to create positive engagement by changing the angle between the sear and the hammer engagement. We're also going to reduce the amount of creep and we're going to smooth it up so that it's not so rough as the trigger is being pulled. So that's the goal of this trigger job. The first step of this trigger job is obviously going to be disassembly. But to disassemble it, the first thing we need to do is decock the hammer. Uh, that can be a little complicated because of the, the uh, disconnector that I showed you. And the reason that I used a screwdriver before is because if your thumb is on top of this disconnector when the hammer falls, it hurts. So don't do that. The way they have this set up, you can engage the trigger and maintain the pressure on the sear, release the disconnector. Then when you pull the trigger, you notice the, trigger, the hammer does not fall. The hammer catches on that lip on the disconnector. So now that that is disconnected, I can put my thumb on the hammer and just drop the disconnector and the hammer will fall. And I can do it gently without smashing my thumb. The first real disassembly step after, after uh, decocking is to remove the, the hammer. And this is actually a pretty simple operation. Uh, I tend to use a, a big punch. You can use anything really. But uh, the vise definitely comes in handy in this, in this case because the spring is pretty tight. So uh, it can take a little bit of pressure to remove it. But I basically put the punch over, over the face of the hammer, just underneath the, just underneath the, the, the lip there. And then use the punch, put my thumb on the top of the hammer to, to act as a counterbalance. And then use the punch to pull the hammer to the rear. And that disengages it from the, from the ears right there and it comes off. Pretty simple. The next step of disassembly is going to be to remove the sear. Now to do that, we're going to have to take this pin out that acts as the forward mounting point when the trigger housing is installed in the, in the rifle. Now that pin also holds in the magazine release and it holds in the sear spring and the sear. Some of these pins can be difficult to get out. Generally speaking, they're not too hard. But just to make sure, I'm going to start out. I'm not going to put it on my wooden block right now. I'm going to start out on the uh, on the anvil part of my vise to make sure that I've got a nice stable platform to to drive it out with. And I'm going to start out with my brass punch. If that doesn't work, it uh, doesn't do it. Then I'll have to move up to a heavier hammer. But I'm going to start out with the brass punch to try to prevent dinging up the pin too bad. Now I'm going to pull the magazine latch back a little bit to remove the spring pressure from it. And I'm just going to tap on the pin and see if it'll come out. Success. It started moving. At this point, I got it down as far as it'll go that go like that. So I'm going to take my pin punch. It's the right size, and then finish driving it out. And the pin popped out it's right there. The pin punch is now holding the. Uh, the uh, magazine release in, so I'm going to pull back on the magazine release, pull the pin punch out, and the magazine release comes out, the 
sear spring. And at that point, the sear will come out. And that's what the sear looks like. Again, it's pretty clear that the angle on this is incorrect. The angle is clearly going down towards the front and that's what's causing our negative engagement. What we need is for the angle to be up towards the front. So we're going to use our stone to recut this angle. But we're, all we're going to do is hold the stone at the correct angle and what we think is going to be the correct angle. It should be close. Each, each one of these is different. These all have to be done by hand. There's no, there's no jig for it. Each one of these is a little different. You want the engagement to be positive, so you want this angle to be slightly up towards the front. But you don't want it to be too positive or it will cause the trigger pull to be too heavy. So you want to just barely have it angled up. So I'm going to start out, and you start out very slowly and very carefully, and you have to be very patient with this not to remove too much metal. And you want to go back behind where the hammer is engaging the sear so that you don't end up with a lip that the hammer will hit, will hit as it falls. I use my thumb as a guide. I'll put my thumb where I want the edge of the stone to be. This thumb, this thumb here, where I want the edge of the stone to be. And then I put the stone up against my thumb every time I stroke. That way I know that the stone is going to be in the same spot every time. And then just start stroking. And I'll take it one stroke at a time. And this takes a lot of patience. You don't want to go too fast because if you go too fast you'll get your angle off. If you end up moving the changing the angle as you're as you're stroking, you could you can round the thing off and make it make it a curved surface instead of a flat bearing surface. And you want it to be as flat as possible to make it as smooth as possible. After you start getting your angle cut, and you can probably see the lines there that my stone is making, you'll actually start to be able to feel the edge. As you put the sear up against the stone, you'll be able to feel the edge. So that'll help you keep it lined up correctly. But at this point you want to start watching. You'll notice that on this side, you can see the marks where I've been filing. They're actually a little deeper than, or a little, little wider than on this side. That means I've been holding the sear just a little bit heavy on this side, so I'm going to angle it a little bit the other way. You want to try your best to keep these widths exactly the same. What That that means you're holding the sear on the stone, stone straight. If they get off like that, that means you're holding one side up, up a little higher than the other. You're putting a little bit more pressure on one side than the other. You don't want to do that. So once you get an idea of where you're at, and you can feel that edge, you can start a little more aggressively. You don't want to uh, put too much pressure on it. Again, you don't want to take too much off at a time. And you have to be very careful to keep that angle the same the whole time. It takes pa patience. It takes a steady hand. Now, my hands aren't incredibly steady. So if I can do this, pretty much anybody can do it. But you do have to take your time, pay attention to what you're doing, and be patient. And as you grind, or as you, as you file with the stone, you keep checking. Make sure that these that these marks stay the same width. You can see them in the reflection there. Make sure, sure that those marks stay the same width. And you, you'll have to continue um, filing with the stone until those marks go all the way to the end. That means you filed the entire, the entire length of this hammer engagement area to the correct angle. And that's what we want to do. And we want to make that as even, flat, and smooth as possible. One other thing that I want to mention is that I am getting old and my eyesight is not that great. So when I'm doing this, I actually have a hard time seeing these small parts. So I have a one of these head magnifier things. And it's got a couple of lenses so you can change the magnification with it. And this comes in very handy when I'm doing this type of fine work. I can zoom in with the magnifier and actually see what I'm doing. And that helps immensely. So, yeah, I think I paid uh, $4.95 for this at Harbor Freight Tool. So it's very, very much worth the investment. Another little trick that can help you keep the uh, 
angles straight and true is to put the stone against a, a surface like my workbench here. That holds it steady so you're not moving it around in your hands so much. And after you've gotten a little bit of a flat filed into the sear, you can put the stone, put the sear on the stone and put it right up to the edge. You'll feel it catch where your edge of your filing is. And then rock it down and you'll feel the flat that you've created. And it should be the proper angle. And, and uh, once you've created enough of a flat that you can feel it, you can be sure that you're getting it back in the same, at the same angle every time exactly the same. And uh, that's very helpful for uh, making sure that you keep this surface nice, this bearing surface nice and flat and straight. I'm beginning to make some good progress. Getting close to the edge here. One thing that can help you as you're doing this is to keep your head directly above the stone and look right down that top edge where it's contacting the sear as you're, as you're uh, filing. You can, by doing that, you can keep an eye on the sear and uh, angle and make sure that it's staying flat against the stone and make sure that your angle is staying slightly positive like you want it. You don't want it to be flat. You don't want it to be negative. You want it to be angled slightly positive up towards the front, just barely. And by looking down the stone, you can keep a better eye on that, on that angle as you're, as you're filing. Okay, our rough filing with our stoning is done. And as you can see, we've created quite a notch. And you can see the, the front part of the, the original ramp, the original angle on this that was angled down. And we've created a notch with our stoning. And we've also, the surface that the hammer is going to bear on is now actually ramped up slightly which should give us a slightly positive engagement. When the hammer is installed in this, because we've removed some metal, and the hammer is at a fixed pivot point there where it mounts. So as, as you lower that contact point, you're actually going to rotate the hammer up a little bit. So we're going to reduce the amount of creep. As you can see, it, if, it was, if the hammer was down, it would be engaged further on the sear. But because we've lowered that sear and moved the contact point, the hammer is actually going to be engaging a little bit less of the sear. So that's going to creep. That's going to reduce the creep to some degree just by itself. It's also going to reduce the trigger pull a little bit because the hammer spring is not going to be compressed quite as much. So it won't have quite as much force on it. So it'll be just slightly easier to move the sear out from under it. So we're, we've already reduced the trigger pull a little bit. We've already reduced the creep a little bit, and we've hopefully created some positive engagement. Now the next thing we're going to do is put this back together and just test and see what our engagement looks like and see if we need to recut and possibly adjust the angle a little bit more. Okay, reassembling is basically the opposite of disassembling it. We're just going to put it together to test. First thing I'm going to do is put the sear back in, slide it in on its, on its rails. Okay. And then the sear spring and the magazine catch goes in on its rails. The sear spring needs to be lined correctly. So I'm going to have to move it around a little bit. There, it's in there. Now instead of putting the pin back in, I'm just going to use a punch to hold it because it doesn't need to be in there permanently. So I'll just stick a punch in the hole to hold it, hold it still. And then the hammer spring goes on the hammer post. The hammer post goes in the hole back here. On the, on the, tr the uh, disconnector and trigger mechanism. I'm going to use my punch to hold it steady again. Pull it back. Compress the spring. I'm going to take a little bit of jiggling and finagling to get it to go. And then the hammer just pops into its holes in the ears here. Now that I've got the angle cut, we're going to look and see uh, whether we have positive engagement now or still negative, or maybe it's neutral and, and uh, we get no movement from the hammer at all. If the hammer moves forward as the trigger is pulled before it falls, then that's negative engagement and that's bad and I need to recut the angle again. If the hammer moves to the rear before it falls, that's positive engagement and that's what we're shooting for. If the hammer doesn't move at all before it falls, that's neutral engagement. That's okay, but it's preferred to be a little bit positive to be for, for safety reasons. 
So I'll push down on that disconnector, pull the trigger, and watch the hammer closely. See that slight rearward movement, movement right before it caught, released? That's positive engagement. That's what we're looking, looking for. Okay, and in testing, one thing I just already noticed is the hammer is, is back and is uh, resting against the sear, but it's not resting against the notch and the disconnector. We pull the hammer back a little farther, the disconnector pops up. Uh, what that means is the notch in the disconnector is going to have to be adjusted to match the, the new hammer uh, geometry here. And that's no big deal. We'll, we'll get to that in it here when we get a little bit farther in. But that basically means that the disconnector is not doing what it's supposed to be doing at the, exactly right at the moment. Now the next thing we're going to work on is the area where the hammer contacts the sear. And as you can imagine, this part of the hammer where it contacts the sear, the very front edge of the hammer is going to have something to do with how smooth the trigger pull is because if this is rough, rounded off, or got hitches on it, as the sear slides underneath it to release the hammer, it's gonna, you're going to feel catches. So we're going to clean that up. Also, as you, as you remove metal from this portion of, from this part of the uh, hammer, the contact surface, we're going to continue to raise this. Again, as I said before, by lowering, by lowering the sear contact surface, we change the pivot point, made the hammer come up a little bit. As we remove material from the bottom of the hammer, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to make it move up just a little bit more, which will decrease the amount of creep, and it will decrease the trigger pull slightly. So as we play with this, now we don't want to take too much off. And I have seen people adjust these to the point where they, they, they get the trigger pull down to where they want it, which you can, you can get the trigger pull down to you know, uh, maybe four or five pounds. Um, that might be a little light for this type of rifle. You don't want to take too much off because that can cause the hammer, as it's, when it's resting on the sear, to be so far forward and you've removed so much spring tension from the, from the hammer spring that when it releases it doesn't have enough force and you can cause light strikes. So we don't want to remove too much metal from the bottom of this. and. Uh, that has a lot to do with how light we can make the trigger. Some, some of these uh, triggers, we can get them down to four or five pounds. Some of them, the closest you'll get to that is maybe eight or nine pounds. We can definitely get it below 10, but, uh, but you may not be able to get it down to the, to the four or five pound competition trigger type weight without doing some things that can cause reliability problems. So we're going to use our stone again to clean up this edge. You can use the, the stone on the front face of the hammer to help smooth out this front edge and also on the bottom of the hammer, bottom face of the hammer, the contact face. The key is to make this edge as clean and smooth and flat as possible. The next thing we're going to do is repair the problem with the hammer that I mentioned before where the disconnector was not catching the, the hammer. The way this works, the disconnector has a little notch in it. You can see right there. <clears throat> the hammer has a, has a ledge on the bottom that catches on that notch. And that prevents, if the disconnector is up, it prevents the hammer from falling even if the sear moves out of the way. And it's a safety feature. It prevents the, the firearm from firing out a battery. When the disconnector is pushed down, the notch moves out of the way and the hammer can then fall. The bolt pressing on the top of this spot on the disconnector is what pushes it down out of the way so that the hammer can fall. <clears throat> so that the, the disconnector ensures that the hammer doesn't fall unless the bolt is all the way closed. The problem is with this rifle, once I remove some metal from the disconnector, or from the, uh, excuse me, from the sear, it raised the hammer enough and moved it back far enough that it will not catch on that notch now. And that's a problem. So what we need to do, it's pretty simple, take a file, flat jeweler's file, and make that notch a little bigger. That's all I'm going to do. File that notch and make it big enough that to move it back 
Just a, just a little bit. It doesn't need to come back far. Just enough that the hammer can catch on it. If the uh, when the sear moves out of the way, if the disconnector is not pushed down. So that's what we're going to do next. Now, when you think you've got the notch filed down far enough, <clears throat> you don't have to completely reassemble the trigger housing to, to test it. You just put the sear back in, put the hammer back on its spot, put some pressure on the on the hammer. And you notice the disconnector is not catching on the hammer at, at the moment. So let's move the sear out of the way while holding a little pressure up on the sear or on the uh, disconnector and see if the hammer catches. And it does. Push down on the disconnector and it releases it. The next thing we're going to do to smooth it out even further the sear rides on rails inside the inside the uh, trigger housing it has two little rails, one on either side and those rails I've noticed over the over the, the course of learning how to do this and figuring this out I've noticed that those rails tend to have machining marks on them well, those machining marks are going to uh, to catch, you'll feel them it'll make the trigger feel gritty as you pull the trigger as the sear moves uh, the trigger bar pushes directly against the sear so if there's a gritty uh, gritty contact surfaces. It's going to feel gritty as it pulls. So the way I smooth those out is I use a 600 grit sandpaper. Tear, tear a little strip off. Now I, I use a straight edge. I use a metal ruler. You can use just about any hard straight surface you can find. I, I've found that a metal ruler works about best for me. And I just wrap the sandpaper around it and then I use the metal, metal ruler to polish the tops of those rails. After you take the bluing off and it becomes shiny, you'll be able to see the machining marks down there, especially if you look at it under mag magnification. You'll be able to see the machining marks that you need to take off. Try to get them as smooth, as, get those rails as smooth as possible. Once you've done the rails on the uh, trigger housing itself, you can do the tops of the rails on the sear. And actually, I do the tops and the bottoms. Just do the same thing. Take the 600 grit sandpaper and wrap it around the straight edge and and, uh, and polish those surfaces up. Now you don't want to take too much metal off because you don't want to make these rails so big that it gets sloppy. But you do want to try to get it as smooth as possible. So we're more polishing than we are taking metal off. So don't use too coarse of sandpaper or, or whatever you decide to use for this. Um, use something very fine, something that's just going to polish it and not take off too much metal. Now that I've gotten the contact surfaces with the sear and the hammer, the angle's correct, and I've gotten them smoothed out so that I know that they're going to be fairly smooth. And I've smoothed out the, pardon the loud traffic, I smoothed out the rails on the sear and on the trigger housing. So I'm pretty sure my trigger pulls are going to be relatively smooth. But the next thing that we need to deal with is the sear engagement. If the sear seats too far underneath the hammer it will have to move farther when the trigger is pulled to release the hammer and that's what causes creep the creep is the sear actually being pushed out from underneath the hammer so the more engagement you have the farther the sear is going to have to move before the hammer is released and released and the more creep you're going to have well as I, as I mentioned before there's actually two ways to, to or three ways to adjust that you can remove more metal from the top of the sear which lowers the sear in effect, which changes the angle and the amount of bite that the hammer is going to have as it as it catches in the sear. You can remove metal from the bottom of the hammer, which does exactly the same thing. But as I mentioned before, that removes some of the spring tension from the hammer spring, which can cause light strikes. So the way I prefer to do it, after I get the angle on the sear correct, and I have positive engagement with the hammer, the uh, surfaces on the hammer and the sear polished correctly, I don't want to remove any more material from them. Uh, I Probably by doing it the way I do it, you'll end up with a little bit higher trigger pull or heavier trigger pull than, than you could have, but I feel that the rifle is safer this way. So the way I do it is I actually remove material from the front of the sear so that there's not as much for the hammer to catch on. That's what I do. The first step in doing this is I'm going to have to put it all back together. And while I'm doing this, I'm going to test this disconnector, I changed the, if you remember, I adjusted the notch on the disconnector. So I'm going to test that and make sure it works the way it's supposed to, and I'll demonstrate that. So 
So first I'm going to put the sear back in. And I'm, then I'm going to put the magazine catch and the sear spring back in. Make sure they're aligned correctly. And again, I'm just going to hold it in with my pin punch. I'm not going to, I'm not going to actually reinstall the pin. Then the hammer and hammer spring go back into their position in the hole. Okay, and everything's back together. So now I'm going to test it. When cocked, the disconnector should be able to move, move up and down. The sear should be what's holding the hammer, not the disconnector. So as I pull the as I pull the trigger and I connect or I meet the trigger bar with the sear, and I can feel that happen, I should be able to release the disconnector, pull the trigger, and the hammer catch on that notch in the disconnector, and it's working correctly. That means that if the bolt was not closed, the hammer would not fall, the disconnector would catch it and prevent it. Then when I push on the disconnector, the hammer should be released. And it is. So that's working correctly. So I'm gonna cock it. Now I'm gonna test my My trigger pull. Make sure that I still have positive engagement. See if it's smooth, and it should be. It is. But I still have a significant amount of creep. There we go. But the other thing that that did, while I was not only did it test the test the system for me, but the other thing that it did is it made a mark on the top of the sear. I don't need to remove the hammer this time because all I'm doing is looking at the mark on the top of the sear. You can see exactly how far the hammer is engaging under the sear and it's got a good, still got a little bit less, but a good eighth of an inch of engagement. So what we're going to do is, first thing I'm going to do, I, I like to take a, and this isn't necessarily required, but I like to take a sharpie and I mark it. I just draw a line across both sides. I get the line as close to even as possible. And the reason I do that is so I have some idea of how much I'm taking off. If you don't draw a line, you may lose track of how much you're removing and it may may get a you may get to have a tendency to take too much off. And then I take my handy dandy flat jeweler's file. You don't have to file the face completely straight. You can tilt it. So I'm going to angle it. I'm going to file the face at an angle. So I'm not filing this entire surface. I'm just filing right up here on the edge. Make sure you keep the file straight uh, horizontally or with the face of the, the sear. Not necessarily vertically but horizontally straight. So that both ears or wings of the sear are the same length. Those uh, red sharpie marks just help me see that I'm filing evenly and how deep I've gone already to keep me from overshooting my mark. After you've removed some metal, you don't have to go all the way to the end of your mark. Stop and retest. And you should stop and retest fairly often. The key to this is not to take off too much. If you do, we can correct it, but it's better to not take off too much to begin with. One thing you could do instead of instead of holding the disconnector down and uh, allowing the hammer to go all the way forward, you can drop the disconnector, feel the trigger catch with the sear, and you can feel it. You'll know what you'll. It takes a little practice, but after you've done it a few times, you'll be able to recognize when the sear is or the uh, trigger bar is contacting the sear. And then release the disconnector. The hammer won't fall all the way, but it'll fall and be caught by the disconnector as it should be. But you can you can feel how far it takes, how much trigger it takes to to make the sear release. And I've still got a lot of creep, which I expected. I'm going to redraw my line. And again, I can see my mark where my hammer was connect, was uh, contacting the sear. 
I'm going to redraw my line. I'm going to take a little bit more off. I guess that time I took about half of what I need to take off. And this time I'm not going to take the entire other half because, again, I don't want to go too far. So I'm going to take some more off, and then I'm going to try it again. And I'm going to take a little more off, and then I'm going to try it again. That's why this, this type of job takes a lot of patience because you have to be patient and take your time and not overdo it, not go too far because you can cause damage, and that's bad. Okay, I took a little more off. I'm going to try it again. Now we're getting something. This next test that I'm going to do is a very scientific and technical test, and it's very important with this rifle because the SKS, one of the most significant safety uh, downfalls that it has is the way that its safety works. The safety does not block the sear, it only blocks the trigger. So, even with the safety engaged, if the sear, the sear can move, and if the sear moves, the hammer will fall and the rifle will discharge. It's important to never carry an SKS with a round in the chamber, even with the safety on. It's just not safe to do that. Uh, but even so, uh, we want to make sure that with the hammer cocked, that a bump or bang is not going to cause the sear to move enough for the hammer to fall. So what we're going to do is take our plastic mallet, and it's brass. my mallet is brass on one side, plastic on the other, but um, take my mallet, and I'm going to do the, do the whack chest test here. I'm going to bang it from all different directions. Bang on the hammer, the sides. I'm going to make sure that the hammer didn't release. Now it won't release all the way because it will have caught on the disconnector. So what I'm going to do is move, and I'm going to put my thumb over it because I don't want to smash my thumb with the hammer if it, if it does go. But I'm going to move the disconnector and see if the hammer falls. It does not. So I'm going to try it again. And you want to hit it fairly hard. You want to simulate this thing being dropped or banged around in the chamber. So you want to hit it pretty hard. That's why I use a plastic mallet. I don't want to mark the finish up. And again, I'm going to test and see if the, see if the hammer's falling. It is not. So this rifle is still safe. We have very little creep. It's very smooth. It's pretty crisp. About as crisp as you can expect for an SKS. The only thing that we have left to do is clean everything up. Well, since we were filing on the sear, on the face of the sear, we may have marred the, the front surface again. We're going to clean that up again with our very fine, finest stone. We'll just uh, polish that a little bit, make it as smooth as possible. You're shooting for a, 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 a mirror-like surface. Make it as smooth as you possibly can. We're going to polish up the face of the sear. We're going to polish up the bottom of the hammer where we, where we uh, filed on that. Then we're going to use our handy dandy super blue and we're going to cold blue everything that we filed to prevent corrosion, make sure everything's properly protected. And that's done by the directions on the bottle so I'm not going to demonstrate that. And then finally as I, when I put it back together I'm going to put the wolf springs in. There are a couple other things we need to talk about uh, that we didn't have to do on this job, but you may run into. If you do get the sear engagement too too small, too slight, and the hammer falls when you tap on the trigger housing, um, you may have to increase the sear engagement. The way you do that on the sear, right on the bottom edge, there's a small area. You can see a little a little cutout with a a lip on it. That's what catches inside the, the housing. As the sear pushes into the housing, it catches on a little on a little notch in there, and that's what stops the sear from moving farther into the trigger housing. So, in order to increase the sear engagement, you file that down at the proper angle, and you can see the angle that it's at. You just keep the angle the same. File that down, and then it increases the distance into the trigger housing that the sear will go, which will increase your, your uh, sear engagement. One problem you can run into if you have to increase your sear engagement is when you, by increasing the sear engagement, you're increasing the distance that the sear pushes into the, the trigger housing. As the front face of the sear moves deeper, it moves it closer to the trigger bar. The face of the trigger bar is right here. That, that 
front face is what pushes the sear out of the way when you pull the trigger and makes the hammer fall. So if you do increase your, your uh, sear engagement, what you need to do is check, put the sear in, put the safety on, and then pull the trigger and see if that's that trigger bar can contact the sear. If it can, then you're going to need to take a little off the front of the trigger bar. That'll mean you'll have to dis disassemble the trigger a little bit farther because you'll have to take the disconnector off and the rebound disconnector out to get the trigger bar up high enough to file it. Um, that's in my blog posting on the subject of, disconnect of uh, disassembling the trigger housing. Last step to this process is to uh, put everything back together. I've already uh, I blued everything. I followed the manufacturer's directions, which says to use cold water at the end. So, uh, of course, after that, make sure you dry it out well and lubricate it. I, my particular favorite is uh, rim oil. There are many other good products out there. I, that's just one that I've always been partial to. So everything is blued and preserved. Everything is lubricated, and it's ready to go back together. This is an optional part, replacing the springs with Wolf Precision Springs. Um, the springs that are in there will obviously work, but the wolf springs tend to be just a little bit lighter than standard, so they will reduce the trigger pull to some degree. Plus, they're just better made springs. They're not made by conscript labor in some factory in Yugoslavia or China or Russia. So they're going to be more consistent and just better springs. So, first, put the hammer back on. Hammer spring back in. This is the wolf replacement hammer spring. And it's a little longer than the original, but it's a lighter spring, so that shouldn't matter. Okay, the hammer's back in. The next thing to do is put the sear back in. Now, one thing that I like to do, and this is strictly personal preference, but I always do this. Take a little tetra gun grease, and I put a little grease on the rails of the sear, which helps smooth out the action a little bit, and I put a little too much on it. You don't want to get ridiculous with it, which I just did. I'm going to wipe some of the excess off. A little grease on the rails, help it keep, keep moving smoothly, and the sear goes back in. And then the magazine release. Make sure the spring goes into the hole in the back of the sear so it's aligned correctly. And at this point, we've got to drive the spring back, the, the uh, pin back in. So I'm going to set it on the anvil part of my uh, vise here and line the spring up, or excuse me, the pin up. And use my brass hammer to drive it into place. And you want it to be even because this is also the latch that holds the part of the trigger housing in. So you want the the pin to have equal amounts sticking out on both sides. That's alright. The trigger should not be able to touch the sear with the safety on. With the safety off, it should have a fairly short pull. It should be smooth and it should be a crisp release. And it is. We also should have the uh, disconnector catch the hammer as it falls does and then as a final check let the hammer fall all the way everything seems to be working properly last thing I'm going to do my tap check, check, test one more time make sure that the hammer's not releasing and it's not and we have a completed trigger job